All right, ladies, welcome to the Be More Human Roundtable from Shiat Day, Los Angeles. So glad to have you all here for Women's History Month. So I want to start with everyone giving a slight introduction, your name and your title here at Shiat. We'll start with you, Candace. Oh, I saw you giving me eye contact. <laughs> I was like, not me. All right. I'm Candace Saltman, a group strategy director here at Shiat. I'm Clarika Hussar. I'm an operations director here at Shiat. Amanda Azoro, um, a construction worker at Shiat. Just kidding. <laughs> um, senior producer at Shiat. I'm Jillian Rudman. I'm a group brand director at Shiat. And I'm Monica Gelbick. I'm design business lead at Shiat. Beautiful. Glad to have you all here. So I'll start with a few warm up questions just to kind of get us started. Any particular ways that you feel like your gender has contributed to particular behaviors that you've exhibited in the workplace, whether or not they're good or things that you're trying to move past? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think as little girls, I mean, maybe for all genders as well, but there's a certain element that you're conditioned to feel like is everybody okay? Does everybody feel good? That kind of like people pleasing, is everybody included? And you kind of like are taught to like hyper fixate on if someone isn't okay, how do I fix this? How do I take on that burden? And so that comes into this workplace and especially as you get more and more senior in your career and you want to be decisive and you want to be assertive, but you don't want to show up too decisive and assertive. And now you're managing other people's emotions instead of worrying about being effective and doing what's right for the creative. Right. And so I feel like it, that's a particularly challenging, I think, as a woman. I think oh, I care less. Well, I think <laughs> I love that. I think, like I've learned to be like empathetic in a way, but like it's my first agency experience on the advertising front, mm -hmm. and those guys like didn't give a damn about my feelings. Like, but mm. I love them for that. Like, mm. I was very sensitive, and so I think sometimes from day to day as a producer, sometimes it can be like life or death. So I had to be like, okay, let's remove our feelings. What are like the top? three things that we need to get done. But I do agree with that point of keeping that center because sometimes mm -hmm. we forget we're not robots. Mm -hmm. um, so that is very important to know. But like, I think as I become more senior, I have to move away from like even my own emotions. But I don't know, like, or I'm very interested in your perspective too, because like in project management, I've seen you come down and like, tell us we're spending too much or next steps and you always bring us back to the center so what are your thoughts on that piece um i think well you saying you don't really care that's kind of how i <laughs> am too i guess but i worked at, a, at an agency that was mostly men who were significantly older than i was but um i was essentially brought on to save a piece of business um and it worked out and i kind of just I don't know, I never really, it was always in service of the work. And so I felt that I was doing what I had to do. And um, of course, I'm always conscious of how something I say might be, may or may not be perceived, but I know what I'm bringing to the table. And if I know that the thing that I'm doing is in service to the work or to what we're trying to achieve, then it doesn't bother me as much. Um, and I, I can't say that I've ever felt any, if anything, I've felt more, maybe discrimination is not the right word. It's like just judged for being, or like seen as being too young to do something versus it a gendered um, thing. But, but that's kind of where it's been coming from. And I, you know, if, if, if there are other differing in, uh, opinions, then maybe that's not the right place for me. It's, you got to strike a balance. I, I mm -hmm. know what you mean on that, though. It's been tough, mm -hmm. I think, for me at, at my level, because as you do become more senior, you have you do have to kind of balance the emotional aspect with like trying to bring it out, like like leave that aspect out of it. And I know me, I'm very direct. I try not to take anything personal. So I'm usually a straight shooter and I'm not as considerate of, of, of feelings. But I recognize that when you do bring the feeling component into it and show that compassion and that patience and that level of interest and, and attention to folks on that front, like from an emotional level, mm -hmm. they work better. You know, you, they bring out more of themselves. But I think it's, you know, it's a fine line mm -hmm. as far as like how you balance the two. Right. So it's it's tricky. but. I will say on a separate note, just thinking about being a woman in this space, it's also a really delicate dance thinking about how do you show up, you know, as a as a black woman leader mm -hmm. 
here too. And I mean, I've definitely got the angry black woman thing so many different times, you know, across my career, which has just been really frustrating when I see the boys, you right, the boys <laughs> saying and doing whatever. <laughs> so temperamental, like more catty than the women sometimes. There's not a light sh shone on that, you know, that behavior and and uh, the interesting uh, personalities that come out of those spaces. But quick to say something about a woman or a woman of color, uh, if she is just as direct and straight to the point and takes out the emotion. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see an end of that, but it seems like that's something that'll continue to persist for some time. But just yeah. an issue I have no, on, for another, sure. on another I, note when you're the, talking the about The intersections are, are crazy. And like mm -hmm. even, Clarika, you mentioned the age aspect because mm -hmm. something I've thought about a lot recently is sort of women having to balance either being too young or instantly being too old. And, you know, there was someone in my life who told me another black woman said, like, don't ever tell people how old you are in professional spaces, yep. not because you want to appear younger or older, but because no matter what side of the fence you're yep. on, yeah. <laughs> there's something coming for you. And I've, I've struggled with that a lot in the most recent years because I think people think I'm a lot younger than I actually Same. am. We had this and conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, it really yeah. like, it, it's really a struggle. It's like but, the same feedback is yeah. being shared to all of us of like, don't share. Yeah, don't, don't share yeah. how old you are. Uh -huh. um, but clearly I am curious to know how you sort of battled with that perception of you being too young to take on certain jobs? I think it's mainly just been communication. Like I I think that, I don't know, maybe I also, there, there have definitely been times where I have also viewed myself as just constantly on this learning journey where I have felt that I'm, you know, constantly just having to work really hard at something to prove myself. Mm -hmm. And after a certain amount of time, you prove yourself with the things that you've done. Um, the jobs that you take, the jobs that you don't take. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I think it's it's just been, I'm also a very slow realizer and it's taken me this long to realize the things that I'm good at and understand what skills I do have and how to use them um, to be successful at what I'm doing today. This perfectionism, like mm. we, we learn really young that we need to be perfect, to be seen, to be validated, to be heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it's good because, because of this attitude, we learn a lot, we craft our abilities, but there's a point in our life that we understand that perfectionism is actually our armor that prevents you to take new steps. Mm -hmm. and, and to break that behavior is really painful for us. Um, because we have our bias too, uh, mm -hmm. not in addition to everyone else. Try to imagine moving from another country. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. another layer to that mm -hmm. because you do have different everything, different uh, ways of working, different uh, attributions, different language. And when you, when you have to adapt to your language, you also adapt your identity. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to learn everything in addition to, you know, finding out who you are in this new, you know, identity. Um, and I, I'm just super, super thankful. Um, it, it has like, I think my first year was really hard, but I was, I think, lucky enough to have few people that, you know, were generous enough to understand the struggle and, you know, just, you know, hold my hands as Pam did, which I really, um, thankful for you you know that mm. um and, but yeah i think all this journey trying to be validated like was 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 something that i i feel proud of mm -hmm. uh because I, I found a way to overcome this needy this need for validation which allowed me to be who i am you know and i think I, only after i was stronger enough to you know Across this this bridge, I, I found myself again uh, in this in this workplace. Mm. I love that. That's a job in itself, like having yeah. to reshape your identity and then still show up and do the job. Like wow. I never That's even sad. thought about that. Like it is like taking on two very big commitments at the same time. Can only imagine how challenging that is. Ah, oh, I cried a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Restructure the entire life. But I think there's <laughs> there's something really valuable in what you said of 
kind of getting rid of that need for validation and being able to seek pride in yourself and in your work just from your own center core. So yes. from that, is there any work that any of you feel like you've done in the past that you're just like, oh my God, I did that. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. What's that proud work that you did? I'm happy to go first. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I've been at Chaya for a while and I've taken on a couple of different roles over the years. Um, so I started a chief of staff role working with Aaron, our CEO, in like March 1st, 2020. And so in my mind, what the role was going to look like and the kinds of things that we do was one thing. And then COVID <laughs> hit and then it was like, OK, this is going to be a totally different thing than what you imagine. And all this like one on one time together, like it's going to be completely different. It's going to be virtual and it's going to be a lot about like how do we structure our business and our community after COVID. And so I think it was a really amazing lesson in going into a role, expecting one thing, having a totally different set of problems and then thinking about like giant problems. And then how do we break them down into work streams with clear objectives? And then how do you break those down into like daily tasks and then like pushing things along? And 2020 was a hard year for our company, just like many companies. But I'm so proud of where we came from 2020 to this point or even in a year because of those collective plans and those initiatives that we put together at that point together when we had no idea what to expect or like how to operate. There was no playbook for dealing with COVID. So I feel proud of the work yeah. that we did for the agency at that time period. Amazing. And I feel like for you, that's such a a wild transition for you over the past four years, going from chief of staff, going to business school, graduating, mm -hmm. and now where you are. Um, did that? Did you feel like that COVID transition or the chief of staff position really pushed you in, in a certain direction or kind of changed your mind and how you were going in any way? Totally, because I think it gave me the the chief of staff role gave me a point of view on how a company runs versus how to run a piece of business within the agency, right. which is a totally different thing. And like you were saying that, Monica, it's a totally different set of problems. Um, but it stretched my brain and I think it pushed me to have a, a stronger growth mindset. And that you could go into something where you don't know what you're doing and then push yourself to figure it out and to learn. Like it feels scary to learn the older that you get, but just keep pushing and take it one step at a time mm -hmm. and then figure out those problems. So I think it made me feel, it, it widened my purview in terms of how companies work, how agencies work, but also how it made me feel about myself in terms of taking yeah. on new challenges that you know can feel scary at first, but then are attainable. I love that. Mm -hmm. Always attainable. Mm -hmm. How about sort of the same question for the rest of the group is any work that you've done in the past that made you sort of shift and say like, oh, I kind of unlocked a new level. I didn't know I was able to do that thing. And all of a sudden, oh, whoa, OK, I did it. I don't think that I I wouldn't consider I'm, I'm a very introverted person. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I ever thought myself to be good at communicating or, you know, just very shy in general. I am very shy in general. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, I had mentioned that I had started this. I had gotten a new job during the pandemic. It was revealed to me that um, one of the clients was about to pull the business. And um, when I ended up leaving that job, the client called me and said that I was the reason why he didn't pull the business. And he 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 was really happy to work with me. Um, and I think from that point on, I have worked with people who I have been, you know, told have been difficult to work with or challenging um, the teams have been, uh, supposedly, and didn't feel like that to me. And so I think for me specifically, it's not like work by any means, right. but it's um, it has been uh, like really enlightening for me to realize that, oh, I'm actually good at talking to people and communicating with people. And there is a different type of communication um, that maybe I can't pinpoint what specifically I'm doing, but it is something's working. For sure. It's the soft skills. I yeah. don't think the soft skills get enough credit. I think at this stage, I'm most impressed by the development of people surrounding me and like the ability to like put teams together or go to the right partner um with things like from films to an execution like dog in the box where we had like all over la it was like multi-tiered and multi-pronged you know productions that weren't just a live action shoot. Mm -hmm. it, it, it infiltrated the community in a different way. And so I'm most proud of like impactful pieces that touch diverse communities that in a different way that someone 
comes up to me and changes their perspective on stuff. With um, the Three Doctors event at UAB, it was people saying, okay, I want to be a doctor and I can do it. Somebody looks like me. Um, we did Dog in the Box last year, but it started with like a live action line produced shoot and again hit Danny up for some of his guys. Um, and then we had a, a transformed a Jack in the Box to look like a Snoop in the Box or whatever. Mm. But the kismet thing about that is down the street, there was a group home with, you know, multiracial people there and they were like, nobody ever does anything like this in our community. Mm -hmm. So I think those impactful stories that weave together something that people may just think is a low rider with food on top of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's like relatable, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think I'm most proud of my community and the network that I built around me to call and say like, you got me? Cause yo, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> what are we gonna do? Um, and I can feel it when I read the creative and I sit down and I'm like, okay, we're going to do it. And we can look back at it and be like, we did that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I think that's, that's all I could ask for as a producer. So, yeah. On the other side of the fence, what about the stumbles? I think for me, it was the validation thing, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. letting go, you know, you are not, it's, it's just impossible to, you know, keep being the, the people pleaser because if you do that, you stop belonging to yourself. So yeah. yes. I think when I moved it to, to LA and I started to like, I was already having all this changes and and design was pivoting from a department to a business unit which i had the mission to you know make that um become profitable but you know it, so girl I had like <laughs> oh boy i was always you know the the girl that no one wanted to talk about because i wanted to talk about money <laughs> and people just <laughs> you know were not you know open to that so i struggled a lot because i could i could feel the energy i could feel the like mm -hmm. how much they they hated me having that chats with me and but i got to a point that i understood that that was my mission in and i was hired ex specifically for that so i and i think i i learned to, to celebrate every single little small victory um, and those small victories gave me, you know, small validations that, you know, made me understand that I was not, I'm not here to be loved, even though, you know, I think because nowadays everyone understands that's because of the work, like they understand it's not personal. I think, mm -hmm. I think I, I was able to start, um, building relationships and, and bridges to every single little team. Uh, but I also understand, understood that I, I'm, I, I will not be loved, you know, for what I do. Uh, and I think there's just two different options that you can track. Like mm -hmm. uh, you want to be loved, uh, the ones that want to be loved and the, the ones that have cor courage, courage to not, you know, pursue that. Yeah. For me, I, um, try to assimilate in a way when I moved to LA. Um, I was at a PR agency and all the things and I found myself like morphing a little bit, mm. like my accent and mm -hmm. things like that. And when I worked at a different agency, like wearing the hoodies and stuff, you guys see how I dress, like it's not a hoodie <laughs> culture for me. Um, but those things I like toned down and I, I think a lot of people when you get in a new environment, like I have a twang, right? Mm -hmm. But like, I remember someone saying something to me who shall remain nameless. <laughs> and I just tried to change that, right? I think uh, people code switch in so many different ways and try to assimilate to, you know, culture in a way. And um, for us that you have, um, for lack of a better word, it's extra ticks on the box, I found myself you know trying to adjust mm -hmm. um that was just shame on me i mean my mom always told us to be as big as possible like mm. be you go in and be excited i remember even in college i had this problem where i tried to make people comfortable and like 
Maya Angelou yelled at me for like squatting in a picture. And she was like, girl, stand up. <laughs> I was like, you know, been for no one. And I, so I just try to keep that at the forefront. And I think at Shyatt walking in here, talking to Antu and talking to Kim, it's like, they know I'm going to be myself. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciate that or, you know, calling Monica or Reiner <laughs> and know it's like, I want this better. How can we make it better? And I expect for her to bring her full self to the table and say, tell me to hold my horses or what's the budget? <laughs> like, I appreciate ab that about you <laughs> or Tarika bringing mm. us back or Candace keeping it real. Like, let's take it back to the strategy. <laughs> <laughs> or Pam is like, you know, that is not a story for PR. <laughs> Uh, and we can shake and bake that way. Yeah. So, I don't know. I've really, like, appreciated this place where, for at least for these women at this table and behind the camera, I just I relish that you guys are yourselves through and through. And I know it's not easy, but, like, that was a stumbling block for me. So I hope that people that are beyond this table can just, like, really move that out of the way. Because if you ain't you, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. So, that was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I so <laughs> identify too. with what you talked about. And I'm sure all of us can identify with it. But and I feel like now is a culture where we can be like, show up as you are. But like, it has not been this way oh, yeah. for over time. Like oh, yeah. it was like, show up how we like can digest you the easiest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of like what is palatable for other people. And I feel like it's been such a struggle for me being in the LGBTQ community and being an account person when I was first like coming out and like had was working with clients. I'd be like, how do I be the most feminine version of myself mm -hmm. and then like would try to like overcompensate in certain capacities and I would be cautious about like talking about my partners or things like that because I was like what would make the clients the most comfortable mm -hmm. with me I need to show up in that way and play that role mm -hmm. But people don't like you when you're pretending to be something else. Like yeah, you're not that likable, you're robotic, mm -hmm. you're checking boxes. And so I feel like over time, I'm happy that we're like coming to this place where it's like actually encouraged mm -hmm. to be more yourself because it hasn't always felt that way. Yeah. Yeah, mm. absolutely. It's it's related to representation. Re representation, like when I see you stepping up and mm -hmm. speaking up, it's like, so hard. It's so I hard. I feel so <laughs> inspired, and I'm always like, oh my god, yes, go girl. <laughs> if if she's not in here, I am going to do that. So thank you. Meanwhile, I'm on the other end of the camera, like sweating profusely. <laughs> like oh, I don't want to say this. <laughs> <laughs> it needs to be said. <laughs> freaking out on the other side of it like mm -hmm. if no one else is going to address it damn it I will because we're so used to just mm -hmm. saying okay mm -hmm. yes and mm -hmm. we're not asking why do we have to do something right. we just right. say yes let's just do it but I'm, I'm getting to a slow point where I'm just like really taking it in allowing myself to pause too and really process why are we doing this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once we can kind of assess that, okay, maybe we don't need to do this. Maybe we should push back, or maybe this is something that could be pushed to a later date. And so I just, that's something that I feel like I'm trying to encourage our teams to do is to also take that pause because mm -hmm. I'm practicing it myself. I'm curious about your life experiences, your life identity, the roles you played in your life that sort of contributed to the general skill set or your general ability to do the work that you do now. I mentioned it a little bit earlier about the perfectionism and being so particular about things. But what I learned from therapy <laughs> is that it's okay to be hyper observant. So we're going to say it's hyper observant. <laughs> um, but that definitely obviously happened from childhood. And I used to help my dad, like um, he used to renovate homes. So worked with my dad a lot too of like pouring concrete and um, installing stairs and doing all these very odd jobs and those sorts of things. But my dad was just so particular. He was like always that, you know, measure three, four, five times over, cut once. It mm -hmm. wasn't measured twice. It was like several times over. And so just so meticulous in all things. Um, and I definitely see how that's played out in, in everything that I do. And being a strategist, I love just watching and observing people and observing things. And I think the best strategists are the ones who actually experience life um, and taking in other people and taking in other experiences and seeing how people engage with the world. Um, 
So that's something I feel like has been very helpful in my career is just being able to watch and to take in um, and and also be just very compassionate and, and, and empathetic of other people's experiences too has just been really helpful in, in all of my roles that I've held to date. I feel like there are a lot of common traits just in terms of like being observant and taking in like I was alone a lot. My parents were super strict. I had to study all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think you naturally, like, for me, for me specifically, I naturally was observant. And, you know, I think you perceive a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so for you, you've applied that to your strategy work. And for me, I've applied it to how to communicate with people and, like, understanding how people want to be communicated, whether they say it out loud or not. Yeah. Um, and that's a huge part of the role and like what we do is dealing with people every single day and figuring out how to get the thing that you need um, by talking to them. And even anticipating it, like you guys are so good at just anticipating like what could happen mm -hmm. and assessing like what to do and being so level headed with like addressing it in the moment. But it seems like we had a similar childhood. Yeah, <laughs> lots of study, strict yeah. parents. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm curious to know in your own lives, who has been sort of that historical influence for you, whether it's a personal relationship or someone sort of in the culture that has influenced either who you are today or the things that you want to do with your own life? I have a best friend that she, she does not know me, but she is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I think that um, I, all, all the books that I, that I read from Brenda Brown had mm. saved me mm. many, many, many times okay. when I felt alone or weak or guilty or ashamed or like <sighs> breathless. I think I always, you know, try and remembered or connected with her content and her podcast. Like, and I, she, because she, um, the way she um, explain all the layers that we do have, like we, uh, throughout her own difficulties. And, mm -hmm. and it's so like, I can relate a lot. And I always, you know, I always quote um, uh, Brenda Brown, you know that. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I learned with, with her that authenticity is an exercise that you have to do, you, you have to go through daily, daily basis, mm -hmm. because if you stop practicing, you stop showing up. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's something that requires from our perspective, from a woman perspective, it's something that requires courage every single little day uh, and more energy and more, a lot of different things. And I think it's not random, you know, the fact that she is one of the, the biggest and the most watched like um, influencers um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nowadays. And I'm so, you know, uh, appreciate uh, appreciative of everything that she, has learned at me. I feel like Erin has been very influ influential to me and many of the women at the agency. When she came into her role, I believe it was like seven years ago, it was still like women in leadership in agencies was like a question. Now right. it's unquestionable, the power of women in leadership roles. But at the time it was like, could women have these big president and CEO roles? And her, the, her ability to command a room to in a mess of things get really clear and down to the problem and address that problem mm -hmm. i feel like it's been inspiring and has like set a standard for the expectations of people in that role and so it's been really amazing to see her and watch her on her journey over the years i love that Agreed. and even on that note just shout out to the amount of women leaders we do yeah. have in the mm -hmm. network which i think is actually quite spectacular yeah. mm -hmm. um so it's a it's even an interesting contrast to the conversations that we're having now about sort of the burdens that are put on you for like oh you gotta hold mm -hmm. people's emotions a little too much but if you're a little too straight to the point then exactly. mm -hmm. <laughs> things mm -hmm. are said about you mm -hmm. and then you look at the network and you see all of these women in leadership mm -hmm. positions and you're like oh it actually took a, a lot for them to get there yeah and it's a positive side mm -hmm. so we're, we're, hopeful. we're hopeful my forever will always be my big mom my grandmother who's mm -hmm. passed um bless her soul but everything from her she had a ninth grade education but could read better than anyone and like re like tell you exactly what was happening in the world um read the newspaper every single sentence end to end every single day had a love of books um raised children on her own 
was a sharecropper, went through, you know, the segregated South, Jim Crow, all the things. And, you know, produced my mother who, I can't even begin to tell you how phenomenal she is. And, you know, I'm a product of her prayers and her wielding me with her hands and teaching me how to be a lady and how to pray myself. And so I will always remember how she treated people with kindness how people moved out of the way when she walked. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's just, and to really appreciate what what beauty truly is, like she gardened and things like that. And I think in our own way, um, in our careers as creatives, we're planting a seed and making sure it's beautiful mm. and like watering the things that need to be watered, uh, whether it be, you know, someone we're bringing up or a project we're working on. So I don't know, my grandmother will always be, she's like, she can shut anybody down. So yeah, <laughs> that's her. I've been really fortunate through almost all of my ex my work experience. I've had, and, and you know, subconsciously, it probably was influencing me subconsciously, but when I think back on it, my first job out of college and internship was at a PR agency that was founded by two women who were probably 26 at the time, both of them. And it was at a time where startup culture was big and you know you could do anything. And so I think that kind of really set the tone for the rest of my career, I guess. Um, almost all the big agencies, this agency included, CEOs, women. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's been really amazing. Um, and probably influenced me subconsciously, whether I knew it or not. Thinking about advice, you are now the advice givers. Step into the mentorship role. Um, what is one piece of advice, or maybe several, that you would give to women, any other women, whether younger or older or peers, that you feel like, this is just a thing you should think about. This is something you should know. I think it's okay to take your time to figure out what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. um, I've always really been envious of people who knew exactly what they wanted to mm -hmm. do, and I always felt like there was something wrong with me that I didn't know what I wanted, that I had so many different interests that I, you know, was slower on figuring it out, but it comes eventually. Like you can, you you just soak up all of your experiences. It's all learnings, it's a constant school um, and it shapes who you are and who you're supposed to be. So it's okay to take the time to figure it out. I'd say never stop exploring. Um, I mean, I think at any opportunity you know, there is, I mean, any chance is an opportunity to kind of make, make a pivot or make a career shift, um, try something different. Like I said, I did not stop until I got into an advertising agency and I'm here now. It took some time, mm -hmm. but I made it and was relentless. Um, but every step along the way before I even got here, everything that I was interested in, I explored it. Mm -hmm. And I, even if I had to start over, Mm -hmm. So from writing to fashion closet to producer to project manager to to strategy where I am now, like just so many different twists and turns, because if I was interested in it, I pursued it. And I think that no matter where you are in your career, you can always make that pivot. You can always start somewhere fresh. Never stop learning. Never stop like experimenting and trying to find that thing that's right for you to exactly what Candace is saying, that idea of how do you genuinely squash limiting beliefs? Because you get an, an, on a path on some sort of road in your career and your idea is like, well, I'm already this far down. My, surely I'm not capable of doing this, this or this, but like, these are like, as human beings, we're capable of doing a ton of stuff. So it's like, if you're really excited about something and something really pulls you, how do you head in that direction instead of being like, well, I'm already here. Mm -hmm. So this is where I'm, I'm sectioned to be, but really just like take the handcuffs off, open your mind up to anything is possible. And then what are the little incremental steps that you need to do to get there? And how can you talk to people that have that role or have had that experience that can help to show you along the way? Doing it alone is really hard. Mm -hmm. Listening to other people and meeting other people and hearing their experiences will help lift you up. So like, how do you squash limiting beliefs, but then also lean on experts in this space to, to get you where you wanna be? Wow, the advice. Um, I think we are so focused on doing extra mm -hmm. that we, and we are always saying yes to everything that we are asked. Um, and we do not pause to understand what we achieved. And I think this awareness gives you strength and the validation that sometimes we need to get out of that impulse. Um, 
situation, um, but it's hard because we get in this routine and we, we want to, you know, accomplish everything that we are asking with perfectionism, like, but, but that sometimes prevents us to understand our, our strengths and our power and our capabilities. And sometimes you have to listen, you know, another person talking about you to acknowledge, oh yeah, I, I did that. Um, and, and I think for me, my, my, the, the visa process was actually a gift because the visa requires you to, or the process that you have to put together requires you to, you know, gather um, award certifications and the uh, articles that you wrote and, and the things that you accomplished. Like putting all of that together made me, made me realize everything that I had done in the past. And I was like, oh, wow, was like, th this is something. So I should like, I felt so proud of myself when I got the approval from the immigration um, that, you know, that uh, fulfilled my heart. Mm. I love that. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. You've been dropping gym after gym, so. <laughs> I don't know. This is really mine. I feel like it was my grandmother's and my mom's. Um, so I think it's a myth that you have to know your worth because we're all priceless, right? Mm -hmm. We just, a number is kind of sure. arbitrary to who you are and what you bring to the table. Um, so since we have to bring a number, mm -hmm. put tax on it, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Don't accept what people give to you because that's what they have, put tax on it. And I think once you start to put tax on it and realize and walk into being priceless, they'll try to they'll start to treat you like the diamond that you are, mm -hmm. but you also have to treat yourself like the diamond that you are. You can't just put out anything, so it works you know, vice versa, put tax on it, you're mm -hmm. priceless and, uh, you know, shake and bake. That's what I love. <laughs> Mic <My> drop. <laughs> <laughs> My shake and bake. I love it. <laughs> All right. I think that just about wraps up our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.